Well, good morning. It is good to see you all here. Welcome to Union Church of Manila. This morning, if you have the Bible, I would encourage you to open to Isaiah chapter 9, where we are going to be parked for the next several weeks as we go through a series that we are calling A Weary World Rejoices, where we are going to uh, take a look at how Christ brings joy into a weary world. Anybody coming here this morning a little weary? You know, yeah, the Christmas season wears on us sometimes and, and brings up memory sometimes, but we want to find hope and light and joy in this season and not allow this world to make us become more weary. And so this morning, we're going to go through, we're going to start in just two verses today of Isaiah chapter 9, and for the next four weeks, kind of hammer out this chapter. So I invite you to follow along on this journey with us this morning. Let's just go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we do just come, and I pray for people, Lord, that are coming in the state of weariness this morning, that you would encourage them by your light this morning. Speak to us in this place, in your name, amen. A few years ago, around this time, my daughter came running down the stairs, comes bursting into our bedroom, and she came up to me and said, Dad, my frogs aren't moving. I think something's wrong. And so I scurried up the stairs, and I went into her bedroom with her, and lo and behold, uh, the tragedy had struck two frogs whose names I can't presently remember were, had croaked. (laughs) That's a Pastor Charlie joke there. (laughs) They were dead and they were laying there and uh, I had to break the news to her that, yeah, babe, I, uh, yeah, your, your, your frogs are, are dead. And, uh, the tears began to come forth in all manner. Why? Why, Dad, I fed them. I took care of them. I loved them. They were my frogs. Why? And I said, well, you know, babe, sometimes these are little frogs, and little frogs, they don't sometimes live very long, and that's just what happens sometimes. But I love them, Dad. Using the diversion tactics, I said, I'll tell you what, after school, we'll go buy you some new ones. No, I don't want new ones. I want my frogs. It's just then Mom walked in, and the tears really came. I said, this is your problem. I'm out. <laughs> As a good father would do, right? You dads know what I'm talking about here. See, and after later that day, I was driving around and I was thinking of my daughter's tears and the thought occurred to me, the death of two little frogs really got me thinking. It reminded me that there are many things wrong with this world. First of all, things die. Maybe it's not frogs, maybe it's loved ones, maybe it's other things, I don't know. But eventually, we're all going to suffer a little bit, and then we're going to die. The world is broken, and things are gradually falling apart. We're falling apart. But then, secondly, when things do die and suffer and break, it hurts. My daughter's tears reminded me of that, that when things are broken, that we, we suffer. There's invariable suffering that accompanies when things are broken. And then thirdly, over time, after all of these things, of the broken things of this world, they add up. And while a couple of dead frogs aren't that big of a deal, you add them on over the years to broken relationships, broken health, the loss of bigger things than frogs, worry about anything and everything, all that brokenness begins to take its toll on people. So by the time, maybe not when you're seven years old, you just kind of realize your frogs have died, but by the time you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, those things keep adding up, and, and we realize that this world is sometimes a weary place. That that this world sometimes really hurts, and our our hurts only seem to get bigger and heavier, and we have a a deeper awareness. Seems like as I get older, I get more aware, I become more aware 
of the hurt and the brokenness in the world. Maybe it's because I'm in ministry and I'm talking to people that are, are hurting often. But I become more aware of it as I, as I grow older and I realize that this world becomes a weary place sometimes. So I'm so glad I came to church this morning. Way to pick me up and lift us up on this Advent, huh? Well, it's a situation that really the prophets describe in the Old Testament quite regularly. In fact, many of the prophets, if you read them, they're quite depressing. They start out describing a problem, describing a world that is not a happy place, describing a, a situation that is, is cruel and sometimes is difficult and sometimes weary. In fact, as we come to Isaiah chapter 9, at the end of Isaiah chapter 8, you see words in Isaiah chapter 8 like distressed, hungry, darkness, gloom. In fact, the very last words of Isaiah chapter 8 are, and they were thrust into utter darkness. That's a pretty rough situation, isn't it? That's a pretty dark situation. But one thing that I've learned about the prophets, that I love teaching about the prophets, that while the prophets start with brokenness, generally they always finish with hope. They always talk about the present situation, but they say, look forward, because there is a Messiah who is coming, and that Messiah is going to change this broken and weary world, and he's going to breathe life, and he is going to bring light, and he is going to change that which is broken. And that's what Isaiah chapter 9 is, a very well-known Christmas text. And, and I want you to notice how the text starts in, in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. It, it says this. It says, Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. Isn't that good news? That the prophets, or, or that the Lord doesn't leave us scripture that ju just says things are broken. Stinks to be you. <laughs> Instead, he says, things are broken, and in that moment, remember this, that your despair will not go on forever. And listen, if you come here this morning, and you are broken, and you are despair, and you are in darkness, this might be the only message you need to hear this morning, that your darkness will not go on forever in Jesus Christ, that he is the light of the world, and he can bring light into your dark situation. And that's precisely what Isaiah chapter 9 says. Look at what the text describes here. It says, The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Now, you look at that, all those names, you know, Zebulun and Naphtali and Galilee and Jordan along the sea. Here we are in the 21st century, and some of us look at that and go, what is he talking about? I don't know what all these names are about. Right? Some of you might know uh, Zebulun and Naphtali as tribes of Israel, two of the 12 tribes of Israel. But outside of that, maybe there's not a whole lot of information here. But I want you to understand, for people who were hearing this, it was powerful. And I need to take you on a historical journey, if I can, to help you understand just how powerful this text is. Because in Isaiah chapter 9, sometimes we blow past this verse 2 and we go to all the other things and we miss a very powerful story. So if we take a map of this area uh, that's called, uh, you can see sort of there's a boxed area there. This is the area that we're describing, the area of Jesus' life, right? Israel. And I want you to notice that this is connected uh, it connects three continents. You have Europe, Asia, and Africa. And, and notice, the primary route between those came through where? That little box where Israel occupied. Much of the trade, much of the commerce, much of the dialogue of nations occurred through this little area where there was traffic going through all the time. Now, when you have a strategic place where traffic is going through all the time, what is invariably going to happen? There is going to be strife. There is going to be war, right? And if you look at this little block of land, it becomes the center of war for years and years, for centuries and centuries. Places like Rome and Greece and Babylon and Egypt are all vying for years for this small strategic piece of land. In fact, 
in this strategic piece of land on the north side during the Greek era, there was a group of people, they were called the Ptolemies. And on the south, there was a group called the Seleucids. And they fought back and forth. And in your backyard, every day, you would have what? Wars. People fighting. Imagine this. Let's say uh, Makati decides to go to war with Batangas. Okay? And imagine living in Laguna. Okay? Now, now what's going to happen in your backyard every day? You're going to have fighting. You're going to have collisions. You're going to have strife. That is all you know. And it becomes this dark place. And you're constantly thinking, should I be a Ptolemy today or should I be a Seleucid today? Because you want to be on the right side when the winning team comes through, right? And so you're constantly living in this peril and in this flux and and in this chaos of life. And even to make things more interesting in this next slide, I want you to notice that in this area, we kind of zoomed in on this area, there is what was called the way by the sea that is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. And it came right through Galilee, this area is Galilee. If you look at that lake, it is called the Sea of Galilee. Good job. And then you have Naphtali and Zebulun who were uh, listed in that text. And this road came right down between Naphtali and Zebulun. And in between there, there was a valley called the Valley of Jezreel. It was a narrow valley. It was only about, uh, you could walk across it in about an hour and a half. You can see a picture of it right here as it pulls up here. And you could walk across it. But This is where this road went through. It bottlenecked into this valley. This is where so many of the wars were fought, going back and forth in this valley of Jezreel, in the place of Galilee. In fact, some scholars have said there has been more blood shed in this valley than in any other single spot in the world. In the New Testament, this valley is known, this valley of Jezreel has another name. The Valley of, anybody want to take a stab at it? The Valley of Armageddon. It's not known it beca- as a good place. It becomes an icon of suffering, of darkness, of gloom, of agony, of world trouble. And so here, according to Isaiah chapter 9, the Bible says that out of this valley is going to come things like rejoicing and peace and light, and good things. And the people heard this and go, went, what? No, not in this valley, not in this area. All this world, all our world has known is darkness here. And yet the prophet says, I'm going to take that, and there's going to be rejoicing that come out of this. Let's go back. How does he do this? There's two. If you look down in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 tells us how there will be rejoicing coming out of this valley. You think it's going to come from a military power? You think it's going to come through a a white horse or a powerful political leader? No, what does it say? In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The world or this valley is not going to change by force of power. It's going to come in a a baby who is born. And that baby is going to bring us glory. Now, I want you to back up. Go back to the place called Nephtali and Zebulun and Galilee. Interesting about Nephtali, if you look at that area, just at the north of that lake, there is a place called Capernaum. If you've read the New Testament, you will know that Jesus spends most of his earthly ministry in Galilee at a place called Capernaum in Naphtali. Now, if you go down to Zebulun, there's a city called Nazareth. Do you know somebody who comes from Nazareth? (laughs) Jesus of Nazareth. You see, what the Lord is going to do, he's going to take this valley of darkness, these cities, and he is going to turn them around, and out of them is going to come something great, something glorious. It will be filled, according to uh, Isaiah chapter 9, with his glory. Now, 
Let's go to verse two. Look at what it says in Isaiah verse, uh, nine, uh, chapter nine, verse two. It says, now, got to back up to darkness here. Read it with me. It says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Okay, the picture is this. He paints that picture that I've just given you. That these people are walking in darkness. You got the mental picture, okay? Think of all they know is darkness. Put that sort of in your mindset. When they're talking to one another, what are they talking about? Dark things. When they hear of news, what are they hearing about? Dark things. Darkness seems to dominate their airwaves. They turn on their TVs. What do they watch? Darkness. All of its darkness. In some ways, though, as I was picturing these individuals, I was thinking it's kind of like today. You know, you turn on the TV or you go on and look at the news on, on the internet or on the newspapers or whatever form of media that you get. And it seems like, in fact, according to statistics, 90% of the news that you get is negative. Did you realize that? When you are reading news, it is negative. And that begins to influence us. And we begin to perceive that the world is a dark place. In fact, in a Times, LA Times article of September 2019, it said that a new study involving more than 1,000 people across 17 countries on every continent say that we as individuals, if we hear bad news, we pay more attention to it than if we hear good news. So because of that, according to this article, what does the news give us? Bad news. They want ratings. They want you to listen. So they keep giving you more bad news. You keep listening to more bad news. And pretty soon, we are just hearing this cacophony of bad news all the time. And according to statistics, that bad news is influencing you. And sometimes it is taking you to very dark places and we're craving more and more of it in our lives. And we are, and you hear it instantly, right? If there is an earthquake right now in the north of Philippines, you'll know about it right when you get home and you'll know how devastating it is. If there's a war, you will know today and we're getting it constantly. It's being fed to us. Most information right now is telling us that the world is dark out there, the dark is advancing, and we need to be afraid. That is scary. There's wars. The economy is going to cr cr uh, crash. There's natural disasters. There's crime. There's corruption. And we are overrun by darkness, that we are living in Zebulun and Naphtali. But I want to remind you that a light will shine. That Christ comes and he came to bring light into this dark world. That while there is darkness in this world and you are hearing it and you are being fed this darkness, do you realize that because of Christ there is so much light going on in this world? Right now as we speak, there is the work of Christ and the work of light going on right now. In fact, I'm going to take you on another historical lesson here. From the year 2000, or from the year zero, or the year 33, or when Christ was born to the present. Go back to 364. In the year 364, the first hospital was established. Do you know who it was established by? Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, who were being compassionate in a dark world. And since then, do you realize that in the history of the world, the number one provider of hospital care comes from the church? Remarkable, isn't it? That's light in the darkness. You can start thinking about the literature. Some of the world's greatest literature and architecture has been shaped by the church. Do you realize that every day on this planet, there are followers of Jesus Christ who are bringing food and water to millions of people in this globe. Our church is doing exactly that. Why? Because of the light of the world in Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, the church is on the front line 
of providing relief for natural made or man-made disasters. It's on the front of fighting corruption. It's actively fighting against the sex slave trade and modern slavery with issues of justice and compassion. It's looking after the helpless. It's had a huge effect on the care of orphanages and orphans throughout the history of the globe. In fact, I read a statistic. I don't know how accurate it is, but I, I, I believe it. They said that 80% of all orphanages ever established in the world were established by Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. And even today, much of the adoption and much of the care of homeless children comes through Christians. When it comes to education, uh, an article from Christianity Today said every major European university was founded on Christian principles. Social reform, medicine, democracy, the arts, modern science, we owe much of their existence to the teaching and the ideas of the followers of Jesus Christ. In the United States, 106 of the first 108 universities were established by the church. Right? Anybody heard of that little place called Harvard? Right? Harvard? You know, that's the first university in the United States. The first crest of Harvard read this. It doesn't read this anymore. But in the middle, it says veritas. This is the first crest. Veritas means truth in Latin. And look on the left and the right. Christ and church. All the discoveries, all the knowledge that's come out of this little place called Harvard. What? It's because people wanted their pastors to be able to be well-educated. Do you realize that? Even, in fact, you know the free public school system? You know where that comes from? From the people who established Harvard, the Puritans. They said that every person needs to be able to read. Why? So that they could read the word of God and have their souls nourished. And so they made free education for everyone. That was not a concept that anybody had thought about before the Puritans who made the, the, the word of God available to everyone. Do you see the good that is happening in the world, the light that is happening because of Jesus Christ right now? Think about that. Take all of the church out in all of history. What a dark world. What a wrecked place this would be. And yet there's light right now. I love this thought. The, the, uh, uh, the American Soci uh, Psychological Association discussing Christianity in an article called Does Society Need Religion? It said this. It says religion is one of the big ways that human societies has hit on a solution to induce unrelated individuals just to be nice to each other. You get that? If nothing else... Christians, the light has caused kindness and niceness and pleasantness. Now, is the church perfect? No. I can take you on a historical journey that shows you otherwise. But I believe this, that because of the light of the world that is shining right now in this world, Good things are happening in the midst of our darkness. And see, sometimes, here's the problem. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed with the darkness, we forget what Jesus is doing right now. We forget the light that is shining right now as I speak. There's light shining somewhere in this globe. Millions of places in this globe where the hands and the feet of Jesus are affecting people. I put number one on your outline. Jot it down if you're following along this morning. When I'm in this weary world and I begin to get depressed of this uh, weary world or overwhelmed by darkness, I need to regularly remind myself that Jesus is bringing light into this world. And he's doing it right now. There are some times when I get overwhelmed. I'm a news junkie. Anybody here a news junkie? Yeah? Sometimes I watch a lot of news. And sometimes I, oh, I can't watch any more of this. And I just need to go and read books and magazines and, and articles online to hear about what Jesus is doing in our world right now. And it takes that darkness and it lifts it up. And I go, thank the Lord that Jesus has brought light into this darkened world. Maybe you need to do some of that right now. And maybe you need to stop worrying about the darkness of this world and remember that Jesus is bringing light right now. This world isn't as bad as we think it is because of what Jesus is doing. But notice what the text says next. It says in verse 2, 
It says, and the people who walk in darkness will see a great light for those who live in a land of, underline it on your text, deep darkness, a light will shine. Doesn't that sound ominous? Deep darkness. I was thinking about this. I was, you know, as I was studying this week, I was thinking, okay, what's the difference between darkness and deep darkness? Deep, deep darkness just sounds a lot worse, doesn't it? I mean, deep, deep darkness. But I, I was thinking, okay, so let's say I got my flashlight here, okay, that somehow burned out this morning and not working properly. Oh, it started working. Okay. So I've got, sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, my, my flashlight here. If I were to take this into the deepest, darkest cave where there's no light at all and you can't even see your hand in front of it, if it was the deepest, darkest cave, would this flashlight work? But it's deep darkness. But it would still work, you mean? I, I mean, I wouldn't go in and say, oh, sorry, this is really deep darkness. I don't think this flashlight's gonna work. It's gonna be overrun by the deep darkness. You'd say that's nonsense. Light always defeats darkness, right? I could even take, I stole this from my daughter this morning. It's her little flashlight that she has in her room to make her cats run around and chase things. And what if I were to take this into deep darkness? Would it work? It's just a little light, though. What, what if this whole place was pitch black? Would you be able to see this? I mean, can you see it? We're lit up right now? Right. Because there is no circumstance ever which darkness defeats light. Light always wins. Light always conquers the darkness. And that's what John says about Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Notice what the Bible says about John. Let's read it together. The word, stop, stop there, I'm going to stop you just for a minute. The word here is Jesus, okay? Just so everybody's clear. Jesus is described as the word who became flesh. Now, let's start again. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. His light came into this dark world, and the darkness of this world can never dis extinguish the light that Christ brings into your life, into my life, and into this world. And that is good news of great joy. So let me give you a pop quiz here real quick. Pop quiz. This is an easy one. Uh, first question I hope you all can get. What day is Christmas on this year? What number day? <laughs> Some of you have gone way above and beyond the quiz. It's on December 25th. You're right. What day is it on every year? December 25th. Okay, what day was Jesus born on? <laughs> if you said I don't know, you answered correctly. <laughs> It is not on December 25th. In fact, we believe that Jesus was born in the spring. That's the time when uh, sheep are giving birth and the shepherds would be out in their flocks at night. And, and in fact, in December, shepherds probably wouldn't be with their flocks at night. So we believe that his birth is actually in spring. And you say, well, how did we get his birthday all the way to celebrate in December? Well, in the Roman period, in the Roman time, there was a festival called the Festival of the Invincible Light. Sol Invictus. And what the festival was, was around the time of winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year. My wife and I, we used to live in Boston, far in the northern hemisphere. And at winter solstice, it would get dark at around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it would get light around 8 o'clock in the morning. And your daylight was very short. And so Rome, think of Rome at that time in the northern hemisphere. No electricity. On the shortest day of the year, what? It's dark. And darkness leads to depression. In fact, there's a disorder called SAD. Seasonal Affective Disorder. It's a real thing. Look it up online. And it's for that time of year when the daylight is shorter. People struggle with depression. People struggle with suicide. The highest suicide rates are in the shortest days of the year. It's where the light is not present. And so the Romans, they're feeling the weight of this darkness and so they said, let's have a party. Let's think 
of the days that are coming ahead. That the darkness will not continue to encroach on us, but that the light is coming back. And that the light is going to defeat the darkness. So they had this festival called the Festival of the Invicta, Sol Invictus, or the Invincible Sun. And when the Christians came around trying to give tribute to Jesus for his birthday, they thought, what better day? <laughs> the, the, the day of the invincible Christ who defeats the darkness. That's why we celebrate Christmas on this day. By the way, when you go and look at Christmas lights this year, don't just say, oh, those are pretty. Go and say, no, it's the invincible sun who conquers the darkness. This is why there's so much light, because he is the one who conquers the darkness. See, what the text, I believe, is trying to communicate here to us is that there is no way, no place, no how that the darkness will ever defeat the light. Is there any darkness that can't be brightened by Christ? We have flashlights. Anybody here have a flash dark? I mean, where I pull the trigger and everything around me gets dark. You laugh. It's nonsense, right? It defies the laws of physics. There is no flash dark. Why? Light always wins. And you have that light with you, Jesus Christ, and it always defeats the darkness. I love that's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, look at this text. He says, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers. Uh, we wrestle against the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It sounds so bad, doesn't it? We wrestle with the darkness. I look at that and I go, man, thank the Lord we're wrestling with the darkness because I got the light. <laughs> and the light will always defeat that darkness. So when you come to this weary world, I want you to remember that the light of Jesus always defeats the darkness. And that's why Paul says you shine like stars in the sky. Jesus said you are the light of the world because you will defeat the darkness through Jesus Christ. In fact, let's look at a few verses here real quickly together. I want you to read them with me. Look at Romans 8:37. It says, "No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us." Why? Why do we have victory? We have the light. Keep reading. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, we've overcome. Keep going. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep going. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. One more. You, little children, are from God and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We could keep going on and on and on of how we who are in Christ defeat the world or we have victory. Why? Why do you have victory? Because you have the light of Jesus Christ. And that always defeats the darkness of this world. He is the invincible light of this world. And whatever your darkness may be this morning, he is the light to that darkness. Whatever it is that you come in that you're struggling with, your darkness will not go on forever because of Jesus Christ. That is a powerful hope for us who live in this dark world. And in our darkest moments, we, we need to be like the Romans and not remember the soul invictus. We need to remember the Christos Invictus, the invincible Christ, who is the invincible light of the world. Second thing on your outline, last thing this morning. When I'm overwhelmed by darkness, I need to remember that the light of Jesus always defeats my deepest darkness. It always defeats my deepest darkness. Even Romans says that he works all things for your light, for your good. Even when things aren't going the way that you want them to do, he is working it towards his light. And the light is still winning, even when you think it's dark. I need you to cling to that this morning because I know some have come in at this time of year. It's a hard time of year for some people. 
It really is. And I want you to remember that he is the one who comes to bring light into your dark situation. And we sometimes, especially this time of the year, allow darkness to take over our thoughts, over our minds, and we can go to some dark places. But the Bible calls you to his glorious light. There's a guy, anybody know Handel? Messiah. Handel's Messiah. Anybody know about that? All you choir people, of course you know about it. You'll be singing it soon, right? <laughs> yes. One of the best known Christmas pieces of all time, right? Is it the best known, do you think, Joel? The best known. Okay. On a word of authority, <laughs> the best known Christmas piece of all times. It's a magnificent piece. But a lot of people don't know the history of the piece when Handel wrote it. When Handel wrote it, he was in a place of deep darkness. He was in a place of deep despair. He was bankrupt. His music was flopping. As a result, he wasn't invited to the most prestigious parties, and he was living in a cheap, broken-down apartment in London. And to top things off, he had just had a stroke. I want to talk about a rough go at it, a, a rough life, right? A, a rough moment in his history. And, and a friend of his came over, and uh, uh, trying to encourage him and gave him a list of verses in the book of Isaiah that were prophetic leading to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ. And so Handel, he looked through these things and he was riveted to them. And he was captivated by these prophecies, one of the main ones being Isaiah chapter 9. You won't be in darkness, but you'll be in light. And he locked himself in the room for 24 days straight and he composed Handel's Messiah as he is looking at these prophecies. And he writes this glorious piece of literature or this piece of music and literature. And, and, and after 24 days, everybody's wondering, where's Handel? Where's Handel? And so what happens is um, one of his friends, the friend who gave him the, the scriptures, comes and knocks at his door and says, hey, open up, open up. And he doesn't do anything, and so he pries the door open. And there he finds Handel crying, tears coming down his face, and he's holding up his music. And he says these words to him. He said, I did think, I did see all heaven before me, and the great God himself as he's going through this whole process. Now, when I was in college, I had my music professor. He told me he believed that this is one of the greatest pieces ever written in history. I don't know if that's true. Would you say pretty, pretty close? Yeah? Okay. Uh, again, on uh, good authority. <laughs> don't take my word for it. But good authority. One of the greatest musical pieces ever written. And even at that part where we sing hallelujah, what do we all do? We stand up, don't we? You know, the tradition comes from King George who heard this for the first time. He had heard the prophet's uh, words. He had heard the music and he, and he hears and he stands up and he's so moved by this. You know, I've got a theory and my theories are always subject to scrutiny, okay? <laughs> but my theory is this. This is the greatest piece ever written because it's the story of Handel finding the light of Jesus in his life. And he puts his talent to paper and pen to music, and he's overwhelmed. Of course you're going to sing, hallelujah, <laughs> right? Because in his dark place, he finds the light of Christ and his life changed forevermore. It's what Christ does in dark places. This is why Naphtali and Zebulun, they said, no, we can never have light come out of here. And Jesus says, light always defeats the darkness. See, when you know the light of Christ, whatever it is that you're facing this year, he can bring light into that situation. And I encourage you to reach out to the light of Christ this year because in Christ, there's a thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices. And yonder breaks a new and glorious morn where the light shines. Let's pray. Lord, shine your light on your people. 
let us find the light of Christ this holiday season. Pray for those who might be struggling in darkness today that they could come and experience what Handel experienced by looking that there is a time of despair and deep darkness is over because the light of Christ has shone on them, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.